I'm Gordon Stewart, and this is episode 5 of Tales from Weird Scotland. Welcome back. This is the second part of our A to Z of Weird Scotland. In the last episode, we looked at all manner of bogles and beasties, the length and breadth of the nation. And so, we continue on our weird journey with the second half of the alphabet, starting with N. N is for Newark in Selkirkshire, in the Scottish borderlands. Scene of a massacre, and reputedly haunted, this ancient tower was once home to the mighty Douglas clan. Newark Castle is now ruined, but remains a very large, strong, brooding tower. The castle was built by the Douglas family in the 15th century. One of their ancestors, Sir James Douglas, was called the Black Douglas by the English. Sir James was so named due to his success at fighting the invading army of England's Edward I, and he fought with King Robert the Bruce at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314, the Great Battle of Scotland's Wars of Independence. Due to his fearsome reputation, for many years afterwards, folk in the north of England, just over the border, would recite to their children the little poem, Hush ye, hush ye, little pet ye, hush ye, hush ye, do not fret ye, the Black Douglas shall not get ye. This as a soothing lullaby, or maybe as a warning to behave. Good Sir James as the Scots called him, would take his comrade, King Robert's heart, to the Holy Land on Crusade, a promise made and almost fully kept after the Sovereign's death. Douglas was killed in battle, but the heart was saved and returned to Scotland. It lies buried in a lead casket at Melrose Abbey, not too far from Newark. The Douglas family, eventually, would become too powerful for the Scottish Royal House of Stuart, almost eclipsing the royal family in power and prestige. In 1440, the 16-year-old William, 6th Earl of Douglas, and his younger brother were invited to a feast in Edinburgh Castle in the presence of the 10-year-old puppet ruler, King James II. All was well until a black bull's head was carried into the great hall on a platter. A bull's head was a potent symbol of death, and this was placed before the earl. The two young men, horrified, were then dragged into the courtyard and, after a mock trial, beheaded for treason. The event would live on in infamy as the Black Dinner, and is said to have inspired George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones Red Wedding. A short traditional rhyme commemorates the event. Edinburgh Castle, Toon and Tower, God grant ye sink for sin, and that even for the Black Dinner, Earl Douglas got therein. The Douglas power was extinguished for a while. Newark Castle was taken in the name of the king and became a royal hunting lodge surrounded by the dense Ettrick Forest. The heraldic arms of King James III and his queen, Margaret of Denmark, were emblazoned in stone above the entrance. The almost continual wars with England so many churches, towns and castles in the south of Scotland burned, and Newark was one of these. 
but it was rebuilt again. Worse was to follow, though, during the brutal Wars of the Three Kingdoms in the 17th century. In 1645, a great plague year, a horrible travesty of justice would take place at this mighty tower. As the civil wars in Scotland and England and the Irish Wars played out, around 100 Royalist soldiers, their wives and children, were captured and held in the castle's courtyard in the aftermath of the Battle of Philip Hoch, although some say as many as 400 people were imprisoned in total. There they had faced the army of the Covenanters, under the command of David Leslie, a professional soldier for hire who had previously served the Swedish Empire and the Tsar of Russia. The Covenanters were Scottish Presbyterians, galvanised into a movement following the disastrous attempts of King Charles I to impose perceived Anglican forms of worship on the Church of Scotland. This, less than a century after the Protestant Reformation in Scotland, was a catastrophe from which King Charles would never recover. Although born a Scot, in the royal palace of Dunfermline in Fife, Charles was very much a King of England, who continually failed to understand the religious or political landscape in Scotland. From riots in the streets, to fully-fledged armed conflicts with the royalist forces of the king, the Covenanters were fully embroiled in civil war in Scotland. And, as so often the case, a religious army convinced of its divine authority can act in a brutal way against its enemies. At Philip Hoch, on the banks of the Arrow Water, the two sides met in the early morning mist. Some 4,000 Covenanters faced a royalist force of half that size under the leadership of the poet-soldier James Graham, Marquis of Montrose. Montrose's hopes would end at Philip Hoch, although he himself would live to tell the tale, for a short time at least. The defeated royalist troops were brought to Newark Castle. The wives and children of the soldiers in addition to camp followers, merchants, laundry workers and the like. All were shot in cold blood, executed by the Covenanter army where they stood, shivering in the castle courtyard. The Covenanters perhaps paused, briefly, before committing this terrible act, but they were, after all, an army convinced of their righteousness and godliness. It no doubt helped that many of the prisoners were Irish and or Catholic. David Leslie would again order a strikingly similar massacre at Dunaverty Castle, Argyll, in 1647. Clearly not a man with much humanity or conscience. A mass grave was seemingly discovered nearby in the early 1800s in a field near Newark Castle named Slain Man's Lee. It seems to have become the victim's final resting place. Newark Castle was damaged further during the war years that followed, but restored again for Anne, Duchess of Buccleuch, apparently the last inhabitant. On her death, the castle was stripped of its finery and abandoned. The new mansion of Bow Hill, nearby, a more comfortable and modern residence for the Dukes of Buccleuch. Slowly Newark fell into ruin, although still stands more or less complete to the wallhead. On the anniversary of this dreadful deed, September 13th, the cries of the victims are said to echo still. Their terrified screams cut short, echoing through the gaunt, windowless ruin. Sadly, Newark Castle seems to be open to visitors very rarely. Perhaps the echoes of the past are louder inside than out. It's a remarkable building, with a fascinating story. Maybe one day more can be made of it and public access allowed, but perhaps a place to avoid in mid-September. Oh, 
is for Orkney and the Finn folk. Orkney is a beautiful part of Scotland, some 70 islands which blend a rich, unique and distinctive culture that blends Scottish and Scandinavian traditions. Indeed, Orkney has only been part of Scotland since the 15th century, having been in the Kingdom of Norway for centuries before. But Orkney's story stretches back to prehistory. Some of the finest prehistoric monuments in Europe can be seen there, including the World Heritage Site around the stone village of Skara Bray. Orcadian tradition tells of the Finn folk, amphibious shape-shifting sorcerers who live in the sea. Coming ashore to steal men, women or children, unlucky captives are taken to their underwater palace of Finfokahin, or to their island of Hiltaland, hidden land. Finfolk, named for the large fish-like fins that enveloped their bodies like gowns, these were terribly feared in Orkney and Shetland. The men of the Finfolk, tall, thin and gloomy-faced, shunned human society, but would defend their territories ferociously, sinking fishing boats that ventured too close to their homes. Fearing the sign of the cross, Orkney fisherfolk often carved or painted a cross on their boats for protection. Finn folk may have shunned society, but they were greedy for human slaves, abducting the unwary from land or sea. Being able to shapeshift and breathe both in and out of water made them dangerous foes. Finn wives, the female of the species, needed human men to maintain their legendary beauty. If they did not capture human husbands, their beauty would turn to ugliness, worsening every seven years until they were fearsome sea hags. The Finn folk could conjure up storms to help their terrible plots and would not hesitate in puncturing fishermen's boats with small holes to let in water. For islands surrounded by cold, deep seas, where the North Sea meets the Atlantic, the Finn folk embody all that was dangerous in the depths. is for poltergeists. One of the earliest recorded Scottish accounts of such a spirit can be read in 1685's book Satan's Invisible World Discovered by George Sinclair. Sinclair records that in Glenluce, Wigtonshire, a beggar cursed a family for refusing him alms. Hanged for blasphemy, Strange events started soon after, beginning with unusual, unearthly noises, knocking sounds and eerie whistling. The Devil of Glenluce then manifested through stones raining down on the family. Their clothing was slashed while they were wearing them. Mysterious fires started in their home. Three months after the first signs of devilish mischief. A voice addressed the terrified family in Scots and Latin, naming local neighbours as witches. The voice claimed it lived in hell and Satan was its father. The terror, including an apparition of Satan's arm, assaults on the family and disembodied theological arguments with the local clergy would last on and off for some two years, ending in 1656. Highly detailed, a fascinating account of the times, and a great candidate for a horror movie if ever there was one. Perhaps the moral of the story is quite simple. 
be kind to those less fortunate. Q is for Queensbury House. Once one of the finest mansions in Edinburgh, near the Royal Palace, Queensbury House is now part of the Scottish Parliament building in the historic old town of Canongate on Edinburgh's Royal Mile. Haunted by at least two ghosts, it's said. The building is infamous because of a grisly murder that may or may not have happened there. Once home to the powerful Dukes of Queensbury, Queensbury House was one of the largest houses in the city, a sign of the wealth and status of the family. In 1707, on the day of the Act of Union, that united the old kingdoms of Scotland and England into the new single state, Great Britain. The Duke's household was removed to protect him from the Edinburgh mob, angry outside the gates of his house, leaving behind a servant tending meat in the kitchen. Most of the citizens of Edinburgh were up in arms, rioting against the loss of their country's independence that the Union of Scotland and England was largely perceived to be. The Union was agreed by the ruling classes of Scotland, not by a popular vote. There was no popular vote, not for another two centuries. And why was the anger directed at the Duke of Queensbury? He was the nobleman who had orchestrated the Act of Union itself in Scotland. While riots were taking place then, Queensbury House was left empty, or so it may have seemed. But it's said that a secret in the dark cellar of the house was about to make its presence known. For years, it was said, the Duke's hidden son and heir, James, had remained locked away out of view. Why? Because he was, as described later, more animal than human, of immense strength and possessing no humanity. Hungry, the young James had not been fed by his servant, more jailer than butler. He'd broken free from his locked room, he wandered the corridors of Queensbury House, following the smell of meat cooking in the kitchen, turned on the spit by the servant boy, who now had nowhere to run. This servant, the little spit boy, was said to have been roasted and partly eaten by the Duke's son. By the time the household returned, it was too late. The cannibalistic monster was packed off quickly into the countryside and died some time later. The little spit boy's remains were buried somewhere, presumably in a pauper's grave. We don't even know what his name was. The ghost of the little servant and the cannibal of the canning gate are said to have haunted the place ever since. The story is probably more political propaganda against the Unionist Duke, but sightings of the ghost continued into the 20th century, and the tale is a persistent one. The irony, of course, is that a popular vote brought a Scottish Parliament back to the House, where the Duke had planned its predecessor's end. Now the Grand House is a house of politics once again. But at quiet times, footsteps have been heard. Little footsteps, running around the cellars of the house where once the kitchens were. A very well-known Edinburgh ghost story. The horror continues with R for Ripper. 
The victims of the serial killer known as Jack the Ripper are often overlooked. Or we forget that they were human beings robbed of their lives by a horrific, vicious serial killer. They were poor women, on the edge of society, uncared for and only remembered for their horrific deaths and the lurid details of the crimes plastered across the newspapers of the day and in many feature films since. As prostitutes, they were deemed immoral and lacking in virtue. Had they been middle or upper class, maybe things would have been different. That Jack was never caught emphasises the sadness. At least five women are thought to have been his victims, although a total of 11 fall under the collective title of Whitechapel Murders, which horrified Victorian London. The gory details are well known, but less so a possible Scottish footnote. William Henry Burry is suggested as possibly Jack the Ripper. Hanged in Dundee in 1889 for killing his wife Ellen, he would be the last person to be executed in that city. Burry moved to the city of Dundee from London just as the Ripper murders ceased. His wife, possibly a former prostitute, travelled with him reluctantly to Scotland as he attempted to try and find work. On the edge of society, suffering the effects of extreme poverty, they lived in a rundown lodging house in the city centre, while Burry tried finding work, for his wife at least. An orphan who had turned to theft and alcohol, Burry had often been on the wrong side of the law, heavily in debt and described as a violent drunk. Burry had previously threatened to cut his wife's throat in front of witnesses. Perhaps they hoped that moving from the vast sprawl of London to the much smaller city of Dundee would give them the chance of a new start. We'll never know their real motivation as they disembarked from the steamship Cambria after sailing from England to Scotland. Burry spent much of his time in a local pub, or, apparently, sitting watching cases in the Sheriff Court building. Ellen secured work as a cleaner, but quit the job after only one day. Burry also bought some rope from a local store, which he took back to his lodgings. Less than a year after their marriage, and less than one month after moving to Dundee, Burry strangled his wife, stabbed her corpse with a knife, and stuffed her remains into a box which he hid in their lodging house room. But some days later, he walked into the local police station and informed them his wife had committed suicide by hanging. The constables attended noting some chalk graffiti on the entrance to their cellar apartment, stating, Jack Ripper is in this cellar. The inquest confirmed murder, and Burry was tried and found guilty of killing his wife. William Henry Burry was hanged by the neck on the 24th of April 1889, at the age of 29. Like the Whitechapel murders, Burry had inflicted stab wounds to his wife's abdomen, and Burry had, after all, lived in Whitechapel. A Dundee woman had jokingly asked her new neighbours what on earth had London been doing, letting the Ripper get away with those terrible crimes, to which Ellen had replied, The Ripper is quiet now. A suggestion that she knew who the Ripper was? Maybe, maybe not. 
Some are sure of his guilt, others less so, and most historians do not consider him to be the person responsible for the Whitechapel murders. The executioner performing the last hanging Dundee would ever see was convinced of his guilt. We'll never know for certain, and the vicious killer that terrified the streets of Whitechapel will continue to horrify. S is for scoring in our weird A to Z. Although witchcraft ceased to be a capital offence in 1736, fear of witches and the devil continued long after. The last woman executed for witchcraft had taken place as late as 1722 in the northern town of Dornach. Poor Janet Horn was burnt for her supposed crimes. An old woman, she was apparently smeared with tar, paraded through the town and burnt, possibly alive. Accounts vary on the detail. In fact, her name may be a witchcraft equivalent of calling someone Jane Doe, a generic name linked to the Scottish nickname of Ald Horny, the old horned one for the devil. In southern Scotland, scoring above the breath was thought to be a way of destroying a witch's power. By using a nail or a pin, a line or cross scratched or scored across a witch's forehead rendered their power useless. To draw blood took their power away, it was thought. There were reports of this practice well into the 19th century, long after the burning fires of the witch hunts had faded into gruesome memory. T is for Chirum. This ancient castle sits towering over its tidal island on Loch Moidart in Argyll. Now sadly ruined and slowly decaying away further. It's a magnificent, picturesque fairy tale image of an ancient Highland castle, with history stretching back to the mighty Summerlid Lord of the Isles in the 12th century. What survives now is later, dating back some 500 years or so. The castle was haunted by a large spectral frog, which followed an evil 17th century laird around. John, 12th chief of the Macdonalds of Clan Ranald, lived here in the late 1600s. His favourite hobby was said to have been firing his musket for the tallest of his castle towers, shooting anything or anyone that moved. He shot one of his clansmen walking along the lochside for fun. When he suspected three of his servants of stealing from him, he hanged the two men from a nearby tree and marooned the woman on a rock in the sea, leaving her to drown. He hanged his cook for apparently stealing his snuff. Presumably hiring staff proved difficult for this clan chief after that. His evil ways caught up with him, however. Having sold his soul to the devil, it is said, he was haunted by an enormous black frog which followed him around. The frog was his constant unwanted companion, a reminder of his sins and his soul's ultimate destination. Whenever he tried to escape from the frog, it would appear next to him. He left it sleeping in the echoing stone courtyard of Castle Chirum, sailing away in his boat to the island of South Uist, many miles away, across the stormy sea. But on arrival he was horrified to discover the frog waiting for him on the shore of the island. 
he tried locking it in one of his castle's cellars, then sailing away, only to spot it swimming alongside his ship, looking at him. Everywhere he went, the large black frog would appear, watching. In 1686, John died in his bed on the island of Cana. An eerie supernatural whistling was heard throughout the night of his death, so loud that John, clearly in the last moments of life, tried fleeing from the sound, his hands pressed hard over his ears. The whistling stopped, and, a cockerel crowing three times, John passed into the next world. And the frog? It was never seen again. John's son, Alan Jirak, Red Alan, was very unlike his father. Fighting for the exiled king across the water, Alan supported the Jacobite cause. Heading off to his doom, he ordered Castle Chirum to be burned, so that the government troops could not put it to use. He stood on the hillside, watching the ancient home of his clan burning. Then he turned to march south, never to return. Chirum has been an atmospheric ruin ever since. This is a well-known folktale which highlights a Highlands tradition of uncanny animals or spirits associated with the lairds in their castles. You is for Uist, as mentioned in the previous story. The island of South Uist and its twin, North Uist, are islands of the Outer Hebrides. Like Orkney, the Viking kings held sway here. Their Kingdom of the Isles blended Norse and Gallic culture together. Here would be the Ku Shi, the fairy hound, a self illuminating creature, part of a rich history of fairy, she lore, perhaps less well known than the Ban Shi, the fairy woman. The Ku Shi's howl brings about death if heard, although accounts vary. She tales in the dunes and brochs of the Hebrides are many. There's much to explore on the Uists, from ancient prehistoric standing stones and tombs, forts and ruined villages, a reminder of the barbarity of the clearances. The Hebrides, though, are also a living, breathing island chain of communities where Gaelic is still spoken as the first language of many people, breathtakingly beautiful and a place many people are lucky to call home. V is for Valley, the island of Valley. The famed ghost hunter Peter Underwood referred to a haunted pit on this tiny island located just off North Uist. A witch was buried alive up to her head in the pit, and over this pit cattle were driven again and again until her skull was crushed. Her ghost apparently haunts the little island still. A sad place, regardless of this fanciful tale, the Big House of Valley and Tai Moor Valley, fast falling into complete ruin, was lived in until 1944 when the owner drowned on the tidal path from Uist. The house, constructed from concrete at the start of the 20th century, was once the summer home to the archaeologist and amateur photographer Erskine Beveridge, whose photography collection is a fascinating and evocative depiction of Scotland's past. The haunting house is now fast falling into complete ruin, joining its near neighbours as gaunt reminders that once lives were lived here. 
once home to over 50 folk and inhabited since Neolithic times, only cattle and birds now remain. W is for witches, of course. Scotland was one of the most ferocious countries where witch hunts occurred. We've already talked about a number of the individuals involved, both hunters and hunted, and there are many harrowing tales of the hundreds, if not thousands, of people executed for this supposed crime. We'll talk more about this another time. X marks the spot in our weird history A to Z. The Stone of Schoon, the ancient coronation seat of the kings of Scots, is an object of legend and counter-legend. When Edward I of England invaded Scotland in 1296, he took as spoils of war many trappings of the Scottish state, including the Scots coronation seat the Stone of Schoon. This had been located at the Church of Schoon in Perthshire, the traditional coronation site for centuries. The stone was said to be truly ancient, dating back to biblical times, and was used to ceremonially link the new king with the land. A new monarch sat on the stone as their ancestry was recited by a shenachi, or bard. By removing the stone, Edward was removing the legitimacy of the Scottish Kingdom. The stone was housed in an elaborate throne at Westminster Abbey, London, thereafter. For centuries, rumours have continued that the monks of Schoon hearing of the advancing English invasion, replaced the stone with a fake. One joking theory is that the stone stolen by King Edward was, in fact, the lid of a medieval toilet channel. The real stone, not the medieval cistern lid replacement, is said to lie hidden somewhere in Scotland. Knights Templars perhaps holding the key, it said, to its location. The stone removed in 1296 was, in 1996, temporarily returned to Scotland and currently remains on view in Edinburgh Castle. The other stone, or stones, remain hidden away for now. Y is for Yester, a ruined castle near Gifford, a pretty village in East Lothian. An intriguing ruined 13th and 14th century castle, it was first built by Sir Hugo de Gifford, a local wizard and necromancer, according to local tradition. In league with the devil, he commanded an army of goblins, which built for him the magnificent, semi-subterranean gloom of Goblin Hall, or Hall, below the castle. It's a wonderful arched great hall, partly underground, an unusual and striking work of medieval architecture. Here, so the legends tell, he practised magic. A stone staircase, now blocked, once went straight down into hell, or a well, 
Who can tell? The Scotochronicon, a 15th century history of Scotland, seemingly mentions the demons, so the legend of this strange and devilish place is very old indeed. And finally, Z. Yes, there is one. Z is for Zombie Monk of Melrose. Although also known as the Vampire Monk of Melrose, despite the lack of blood drinking. The magnificent ruins of Melrose Abbey display the beauty and craft of the architects and stonemasons who created it. Built as the Abbey of St. Mary the Virgin, Founded in 1136 by David I, King of Scots, the church was attacked many times during Scotland's Wars of Independence and then rebuilt. The heart of Robert the Bruce, mentioned earlier, lies buried here, as does the body of King Alexander II of Scotland. The building features wonderful carvings, including the Green Man, Demons, angels, and a bagpipe playing pig. The zombie monk story dates back to the 12th century and is one of the earliest European stories about zombies, or vampires, but zombies. Around the year 1170, a monk or priest of dubious sanctity died. Known locally as the Hounderprest, Hound Priest, because of his fondness for hunting with his pack of hounds, he was said to have been a womanising drunk. On his death, and repelled from the abbey by the power of prayer, the undead man was said to rise from his grave every night and wander the local area forcing his way into the home of his former mistress and generally terrifying the townsfolk. Four monks from the abbey were dispatched to deal with this ghoul. They managed to force him back into his grave using axes and warrior monk moves and they guarded the tomb until morning. Then his body was dug up, burnt, and the ashes dispersed and he was never seen again. Melrose Abbey is also the apparent resting place of another great Borders legend, the Wizard of the North, Michael Scott. But that's a story maybe for another time. I hope you've enjoyed this second trip around the strange places and legends of Scotland. Thanks for listening and we hope you'll join us again soon. From ghoulies and ghosties, and long-leggedy beasties, and things that go bump in the night, good Lord, deliver us. That was Gordon Stewart. Check out his blog at borderlandscotland.wordpress.com. This episode was written by Gordon Stewart. It was produced and radiophonically designed by me, Nick Cole Hamilton, with additional instrumentation from Jonas Ray. This is a You Better Run Media production. Join us again soon for more Tales from Weird Scotland. <laughs>